say it's uh, about 10 times uh, bigger at the very least uh, relative to uh, the previous interstellar object and uh, maybe even uh, 50 times uh, bigger than the first interstellar object. And that means that uh, it's somewhere between uh, 1,000 to 100,000 times more massive than the other two interstellar objects that we've seen before. Now, how do we know that? Uh, it's basically, we see how much uh, material is evaporating from the surface of the object in the direction of the sun. And that tells us uh, how much push the object could get uh, from that evaporation. But we don't notice, uh, based on all the data that was collected between the 15th of May and uh, the 23rd of September, there is no uh, indication that the object is being pushed away from the sun. And based on all the data that was collected uh, in about 4,000 observations from 227 uh, uh, observatories around the world, we were able in a new paper to set a limit on the mass of the object. It has to be very massive so that this uh, evaporation is not pushing it much. Uh, and uh, we get a mass of 33 billion tons. That's the minimum mass. The object needs to be more massive than that, 33 billion tons, so that it will not be pushed back by the level of evaporation that was measured for it. And uh, that means uh, if you translate that for solid density, uh, you end up with a size that must be larger than five kilometers. Now, this is just a lower limit. It could be much larger than that. It could be larger than Manhattan Island. Five kilometers is about half the size of Manhattan Island. So we don't know how big it actually is, uh, but we have a, lim a lower limit, uh, a minimum mass, that a minimum size that it could have, and that one is already, you know, 100,000 times bigger in mass than the first interstellar object. Now, why is that puzzling? Well, there is a, a limited reservoir of material available in interstellar space, and we should have seen 100,000 objects like the first one, Oumuamua, uh, that was the first interstellar object. It was given the name Oumuamua because it was discovered by a telescope in Hawaii. And that means a scout in the Hawaiian language. So there should have been 100,000 of those small ones of the order of the size of a football field, about a, a tenth of a kilometer in size. For every big one that is uh, the size, the minimum size that we infer for the new interstellar object, 3i Atlas. And we haven't seen 100,000 small ones. In fact, we saw only one or maybe two um, and that raises a big question of how come we are seeing such a rare giant object uh, as the third object from interstellar space. And uh, it also looks anomalous in other ways. It, uh, it, its uh, path is in the plane. It's very well aligned with the plane of the planets around the sun. And it has also uh, unusual materials uh, being shed off it, like nickel without iron that we are, we only find in industrial production of uh, nickel alloys. And so all of this raises the question of whether it might be alien technology. Maybe, you know, uh, the, the path that it took was designed. Uh, it was fine-tuned to come close to planets. That's why it's in the same plane. And the size is much bigger than we expect for a rock because this is not a rock. And uh, so all of this is, is really intriguing. And, and the fun thing of uh, doing science, you know, the, the fun of uh, uh, discovering uh, more and more evidence about uh, the object is that we can let the, the data educate us. We don't need to know the answer in advance. Uh, and as I often say, you know, uh, the best way to tell the difference between a curious scientist and a dogmatist is to flood them with data. The dogmatist will be worried that the data will uh, violate uh, uh, past uh, uh, beliefs. Uh, and uh, the curious scientist, the genuine scientist, will be delighted to learn something new. And I, I belong to the second category. I very much look forward to the coming month because... 
Uh, actually, on the 3rd of October, we will get uh, a high-resolution image of this object with uh, the high-rise camera that is in orbit around Mars. It's on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and it could get a, a pixel resolution of 30 kilometers. So um, the brightest pixel in the image will put a very tight uh, constraint on the size of uh, 3i Atlas and this, this new interstellar object. And uh, if it looks even bigger than uh, five kilometers in diameter, you know, it, it may be up to 46 uh, kilometers in diameter based on uh, other data. You know, if it's that big, I would actually uh, be quite concerned about the, it not being natural uh, because it will uh, be untenable to produce such a giant rock that arrives to our neighborhood <clears throat> over the past decade. We expect it to arrive maybe once every uh, several millennia or uh, ten tenths of millennia. And the fact that we saw it over the past decade is really surprising. Uh, I want to know, you mentioned following the data here. What does the data show you in the past? Is there anything that you can compare this to in the past? Or is this something just completely brand new that we've absolutely never seen before? Yeah, it's something we've never seen before because uh, uh, only over the past decade, we had uh, telescopes that can survey the sky for such objects that are sensitive enough and um, uh, computers that can uh, uh, digest large quantities of data uh, as we currently have. So this is a completely new frontier. And we found so far only three objects from interstellar space, from outside the solar system. We know that they came from uh, far away because they are not bound by gravity to the sun. They're moving too fast. And this one is the fastest. It's moving uh, 600 times faster than the fastest race car that we have on Earth. I calculated that because uh, uh, a, a car racer in uh, NASCAR wants to, to put an image of this object and my image on the hood of his car. And in two weeks, he will go to the, with that car to compete uh, in uh, Vegas, in Las Vegas. Uh, and I calculated, I told him that irrespective of how um, uh, fast he goes, he will not uh, move uh, uh, even close to, to 3i Atlas, uh, which is moving 600 times faster at 60 kilometers per second. And um, not only that it's very fast, but uh, it's also anomalous in, in other ways. And, you know, it's only the third object that we found. In the future, we might find many more because now we have the Rubin Observatory in Chile that can discover a new one every few months. So, um, in my view, we should check each and every one of them, uh, whether it's a rock, a natural object, or perhaps some technological probe that uh, you know was produced by another civilization, the way we produced uh, Voyager, Pioneer, New Horizons. Uh, we might not be the smartest kid on the block, and uh, we should just open our eyes and see what comes our way from outside the solar system. Uh, you mentioned this object in Chile. Well, who has access to that? And uh, for your research, how does that compare to what we're currently seeing? Well, the data that I am referring to that we analyzed, uh, first of all, there is data from um, uh, about 227 observatories uh, on Earth. Uh, these are telescopes all around the world. But in addition to that, we have space telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope or the Hubble uh, uh, Space Telescope that uh, were observing this object. And we are using all the data at our disposal to figure out its nature. And uh, the limit that uh, the minimum uh, mass of this object, the minimum size of this object that I mentioned before, uh, was obtained by using all of this data in a paper that I uh, submitted uh, to a journal uh, today. And so it's very exciting because this is a new result. It gives us a, a minimum uh, mass, uh, which is already very large. It's uh, 33 billion tons. Uh, this object is is, gi is a giant object. It's huge, and um, it might be even bigger than that. And we are just learning about it. And um, more evidence, more data. It's just like a detective story. The more you have, 
the better your understanding is of, of, of what the nature of, of, of the object is. And, um, and so uh, I'm looking forward to what uh, we might learn from in the coming month as it comes close to Mars on October 3rd, which is just around the corner next week. Um, and then uh, after that, it will pass close to the sun on October 29th. Uh, unfortunately, the Earth would be on the opposite side of the sun. We won't be able to observe this object because the sun will be in our way. Uh, but then uh, on March 16th, 2026, this object will come close to Jupiter. So I'm quite confident we'll have a lot of information about it. And what I really care about is whether the object is natural, a comet, uh, or perhaps technological, in which case, you know, it will change everything for us. And I defined a new scale that is now called the lobe scale, which uh, is using a, a rank of zero for a completely natural object and a rank of 10 for a, a technological object that might be a threat to humanity. Uh, and as of now, I give this object a rank of four. Ooh. And I expect that in the coming weeks, we'll know more about it. So I can either dial it down or dial it up. It, what exactly are you using, I guess, for this reference and for this low scale? Uh, what right. what things are you using to determine uh, between zero and ten? You say currently we're at a four, but we're expecting another update in October. Uh, do you right. have any predictions on if that number is going to go up or if it's going to go down based on when we get this next update in a couple of weeks? No, I think we should be humble and not uh, assume that we can guess the answer in advance. But if you ask me, what, how do I get to the rank of four? Well, it's because of the anomalies of this object. There are five of them. One is the large size that uh, I already mentioned that, you know, there isn't enough rocky material in interstellar space to deliver such a, a giant object uh, made of rock uh, to our backyard uh, over the past decade. There is just not enough. And uh, the second is the fact that um, the object is in the plane of the planets around around the sun, which is surprising. There is a chance of one in 500 for that to happen at random. So that's a very small chance, one in 500, given that this is only the third object that we found. And then uh, uh, there was um, a glow around the object. Um, usually around comets, you get some reflected sunlight from dust particles. Uh, and then the dust particles reflect sunlight and are pushed away from the sun. So you see that as a cometary tail. But for this object, the glow, the scattered sunlight was ahead of the object towards the sun. It was actually 10 times longer than it was wide. And um, that was very puzzling. What, why is this object behaving in a way that you don't see a cometary tail behind it, uh, away from the sun, but instead you see something towards the sun. And, and that was true in July and August. Uh, and the, the physics of that, why that happened, is still not completely clear. Uh, and then, uh, in addition, the object turned green recently. Uh, it's not clear what is producing the green color. Uh, there is... Uh, a, a plume of gas around it that is made mostly of carbon dioxide, not water. 87% is of that plume in mass is carbon dioxide and only 4% is water. The rest is uh, carbon monoxide. And uh, there is a, an increasing, a rapidly increasing uh, amount of um, cyanide and uh, uh, also uh, uh, nickel without any iron coming out of it. And uh, the only place in nature where we find nickel without iron is when we produce nickel alloys. And uh, so the question is whether this uh, uh, nickel without iron in the, in the cloud of gas around it was uh, a result of a technological uh, production process that made this object. Um, so these are various uh, 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 you know, puzzles ab ab about it that uh, we don't fully understand, and I, I, my approach is uh, when you have anomalies of this type, uh, you know, we should keep our eyes on the ball. We should uh, try and figure out what the nature of the object by collecting more data, more observations, more information from all the, the assets that we have in space. And in fact, uh, I spoke with uh, uh, Representative uh, Anna Paulina Luna, 
and uh, she asked me for an update about 3i Atlas, and I mentioned the fact that NASA has uh, various observatories, like uh, a spacecraft called Juno around Jupiter that can be used to observe this object when it comes close to Jupiter. And, and she wrote, uh, very graciously, she wrote a letter to the head of NASA, uh, Sean Duffy, um, uh, to encourage NASA to take that data. So I very much look forward to the coming weeks where we will learn more about it. All right, we're looking forward to that update, and I'm sure we'll be checking right back in with you as soon as we find out. Uh, we learn a little bit more about this very, very, very large object that is currently floating in space. Uh, Professor Harvard Professor Avi Loeb, thanks again, as always, for your time, and we look forward to hearing from you in the next week or so. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.